Good afternoon, and welcome to day two of Red Cloud's 2022 pre PDAC mining showcase. We would like to thank Newsfile for sponsoring this session. My name is Alina Islam, and I'm a senior research associate here at Red Cloud Securities. Next, we are pleased to host Japan Gold and have with us John Proust, chairman and CEO of the company. John, you will have 15 minutes for your presentation, followed by a five minute Q&A session. Attendees, please feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A link and we will get to as many as we can at the end. With that, John, I'll turn it over to you to start the presentation. Thank you, Alina, and uh, welcome everybody. And uh, thank you to Red Cloud for hosting this event. Um, <clears throat> just following on uh, Alina's uh, uh, opening comments there, um, I would suggest that if you do have any uh, top of mind questions that you would like to ask because of the compressed nature of the uh, of the session today, 15 minutes uh, for uh, presentation, and five minutes for follow up. Um, please submit the questions as soon as possible so they're able to be transmitted to the moderator. So thank you for joining today. Um, I'm very pleased to speak with you and I'm going to make some very focused remarks. Uh, so um, and I'm sharing my screen with you uh, as we as we speak. Um, I will be touching on some forward-looking statements today as I go through um, some uh, specific slides in our presentation today. Um, I'd like to start always with the investment rationale in terms of our first mover advantage into Japan, the fact that we have a portfolio of 31 projects in the country, um, and that we have a countrywide strategic alliance with Barrick on 29 of those 31 projects. And then we also have two independent projects that are supported by Newmont. We do have a very significant set of shareholders um, that are continuing to be very actively engaged uh, with the company, and we have a very strong management team leading the company forward. So to move right into it, we've made two significant uh, announcements in the last week, uh, one regarding the Barrick Alliance and the other regarding drilling results, and I'll move into the discussion of the Barrick Alliance first. So the Barrick Alliance uh, that we actually, I'll go to one slide before that. Um, the Barrick Alliance uh, that is in place today was formed almost exactly two years ago. And it's a countrywide alliance where Barrick is solely funding the advancement and evaluation of 29 projects. And we've done an enormous amount of work on those projects in the last two years. Um, and the project is broken down or the alliance is broken down into several phases. Uh, so the first phase is that initial evaluation of all 29 projects, at which point Barrick will then determine the uh, projects they would like to advance going forward. Um, if they like a project going forward, they only earn an interest when they complete a pre-feasibility study, they get 51%. When they complete a bankable feasibility study, then they get 75% and Japan Gold is fully carried through bankable feasibility. So the, uh, the uh, alliance is well underway, and again, a significant amount of work is being completed uh, to date. Now, in, in, in order to, uh, to expand on that a little bit more, um, we made an announcement uh, in this past week that we are extending the initial two-year evaluation period by six months. This was at, at the request of Barrick, and it's something that we're very pleased and positive about. Um, to fill in the rationale, first of all, Barrick has spent a lot of money evaluating the 29 projects. Um, they spent 5.6 million US dollars up to December 31st, 2021. They've already spent another $400,000 to start off this year, so we're at about $6 million. And we're actually meeting later today to talk about our budgets and programs uh, for um, the balance of the, uh, the evaluation period and beyond, uh, which we expect will include drilling later this year. So um, it's moving well, uh, and Barrick is, is well committed. This follows along from a, um, a summit meeting or a workshop that we held in Vancouver with 18 participants uh, at the end of 2021, when we were able to really um, distill the areas of interest in Japan that, uh, that Barrick was uh, interested in. And, uh, and to refine um, the programs uh, that we were going to go forward with. Um, so it's been a very positive time. And as we've gone through this initial evaluation period with our geochemistry and geophysics, 
we've identified in excess of 40 significant gold anomalies across our portfolio. In a number of cases, these um, gold anomalies have spilled outside the boundaries of our project areas. And so we've stepped in and picked up additional ground. So in the two years, this first two year period, we've expanded the area of our project portfolio under the Barrick Alliance by over 42%. So a significant expansion. Um, so with the large number of prospective anomalies, the expansion of our portfolio, and an issue of traveling into Japan with the Barrick uh, technical team, um, we've made the agreement to extend the Alliance evaluation period till the end of August, to August 31st, 2022. Barrick has a plan to bring in six technical, um, a team of six technical people into Japan for upwards of two months to really put boots on the ground and, and see the areas of interest that we've been focused in on. And that's gonna be a very, very productive time. And in this six month period, we're continuing to do that uh, preliminary work across any expansion areas and then we're doing additional work to help us really refine and rate and rank those uh, the, the targets that we're seeing. Um, on the slide that I've highlighted uh, 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 here uh, that's on your screen, there's a quote by Joel Holiday, who's the Executive Vice President of Barrick in charge of exploration globally. Um, he's been the team leader that has, uh, has really propelled this, uh, this program along. And it's a, a very worthwhile quote to, uh, to quickly review. Um, we have done an exceptional amount of work through the pandemic, uh, given that uh, the, the circumstances, of course, um, Barrick has, has noted that we are one of the best companies in the world that's been able to complete significant work programs and come up with very meaningful results. So the Barrick uh, Alliance is, is, is progressing well. And uh, we're, we, uh, again, we're very uh, happy to see the results that we're, uh, we're seeing from our, our programs, our work programs. And we look forward to, to uh, getting the drill bit uh, into the ground uh, on a Barrick project uh, in the fourth quarter of this year. Moving on from there, uh, and I'm going to take you back to uh, just a country overview. So we've been talking about uh, Japan as a whole and the three main islands. Uh, we've been focused on um, uh, the Barrick Alliance portfolio, which you can see is, is covering across Kyushu in two areas, up on the uh, Noto Peninsula with the Togi project and up into Hokkaido. Outside the Barrick Alliance, we have two projects that are our two most advanced projects in the country. One is located down in the Kyushu in the south and southern epithermal uh, gold area. And it's just in this area right here that I've highlighted. There's one right in the middle there. This is the area, of course, that hosts the Hishikari gold mine, um, which is uh, a Sumitomo metal mining producing asset. The only gold mine in Japan that's produced over 8 million ounces at between 30 and 40 grams per ton. And then we have a second asset um, or a second project that's outside the Barrick Alliance up in Hokkaido. And this is the, the project that we are singularly focusing our drilling activities on now and have been since uh, June of last year. Um, so I'm going to take you to that project now. Um, so we're going to move up to Hokkaido and we're going to go into that metallogenic province. Um, there's a number of projects that are outlined in red here that are the Barrick Alliance projects. And we're going to focus on the light blue area, which is the project that uh, Newmont has the right of first refusal on. So to be precise about that, we solely fund the activities on the Akutahara project. Uh, so we're funding all of the drilling activities uh, from the proceeds of our financing that we concluded in July of last year. Um, and we have got a very comprehensive drilling program starting in March that's going to go right through the year on multiple prospects there. So I'm going to take you to the Akutahara project. The Akutahara project, and, and this is a geology map that shows the older blue basement rocks um, and on top of them, the younger uh, volcanics in yellow with the rhyolites of sort of poking through or windows through to the rhyolites in the buff colored area. And these are the, um, uh, the, these are the, uh, the areas that are hosting the quartz veins that are the targets of our drill programs. On this particular project, we have highlighted uh, on this, this uh, sketch that there are over 20 historic gold mines, high grade gold mines or significant uh, surface workings that were all closed by the government in 1943. 
We've done all the preliminary work in this area, the mapping, the geology, the geophysics, the geochemistry um, uh, with nuanced guidance. And we've now highlighted in red ovals the key areas that are our prospects for drilling. In June of last year, we started drilling at the Rio prospect. And typically what we do is we drill three or four holes, initial scout holes at a prospect to identify uh, if there's um, uh, something worth following up on. And if that's the case, we continue to stay there and move on. And we've been at the Rio prospect ever since. So we will be drilling um, uh, another eight holes shortly at the Rio prospect, but I will um, uh, dive into the Rio prospect and show you the outstanding drill results that we've had so far. So I'm gonna blow up the Rio prospect for you now. The map that you see in front of you is a sketch of the Rio prospect that runs about 1.2 kilometers from the southwest to the northeast. Um, the pink uh, shaded area are those rhyolites of the perfect host for the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the gold uh, quartz veins that we're looking for, the gold bearing quartz veins that we're looking for. Um, and I'm going to um, now show you that there were actually historically five areas that were being mined, one, two, three, four, and five, five areas that would be mined right along this mineralized corridor uh, in 1943 um, when the government closed the mine. So what we did is we came into this area and we drilled under um, three of the mine workings to start and we had very positive results. And so I'm gonna show you the results from one of the areas from the area up here in the north. So this slide is a cross section of that area. Um, at that time in 1943, they were mining on six different levels. So this is a big hill. They were mining on six different levels and um, the lowest level would have been the water table. So they couldn't have gone beneath that on mining these fairly vertical veins because they didn't have the pumping capacity um, to get rid of the water. After the war, um, these um, workings were sampled. And on this level four that I'm uh, indicating now, level four um, was a, a vein that was about half a meter wide um, that ran uh, into the hillside. Um, the red area is approximately 72 meters um, and was consistently sampled at over 40 grams per ton. So clearly a high grade um, event, similar to Hishikari grades. So what we did is um, we went into this area, we stepped back and we drilled 50 meters under the old working. So our initial drill hole or pierce point was here. Um, our interval was five meters wide, not half a meter, but five meters wide. And we wanted to see if the grade increased and if the width of the veins increased. And indeed five meters was a lot larger than half a meter. The grade that we intersected was 12 meters. Um, and within that, there was a just over half a meter interval that ran almost 60 grams a ton. So this proved up our thesis that the uh, veins were getting wider as they got deeper and the grade was getting higher. We then drilled our most recent hole under this area and uh, we were very excited about the results. We came up with a, a zone 20 meters wide, uh, 20 meters wide, averaging 6.3 grams and again, in the center of that 0.65 of a meter at 92 grams. So this blew out into a, a, an area, a blind area that, that the, the old timers wouldn't have been able to identify that really bodes well for this prospect. What that means for us is that, so we had very strong results um, at the, the north end here that I've just indicated to you. So we've had strong results. So then we stepped out 500 meters to this area. And our first drill hole, a very shallow drill hole, was two meters of just over six uh, grams per ton. We then drilled under those workings and we were very uh, pleased to report an ultra high grade intersection of approximately half a meter, of approximately half a meter at 1,395 grams per ton. What that indicates for us is that there's a very strong gold system here, it's been able to push that quantity of gold up near the surface. And so we stepped out another 250 meters down to this area and again had a, a, a very positive interval of one meter at 30 grams per ton. So I like to use the analogy of a buried uh, deciduous tree. Um, so if I think of the surface being up here, that there's a deciduous tree that's underground, 
you've got the thin branches, the thicker branches. Ultimately, we're going to get to the trunk, which is that feeder zone that we, we would like to target. Um, with the type of work that we've done now, we've identified that the old timers, the historic workings, have generally gone down 75, maybe as much as 100 meters. But typically, this buried tree is generally 100 meters to 400 meters below the surface if it's a fully intact system. And that's what we're finding is fully intact systems. So they were just mining what was at the top of the system. And our drilling is, is demonstrating that there's significant um, opportunity beneath that. So we'll be drilling eight more holes across this, uh, this prospect to not only prove up the, the grade and the tonnage at the north end, but also to, to follow up on these significant intervals that we're finding going to the south. Um, our plan for this year is to drill eight more holes starting in March at the Rio Prospect, then to move on from there. And um, while those holes are in the lab being assayed, we'll go down to the Saroma Valley and put four holes under these three mines um, as our initial holes there to determine um, uh, the prospectivity there. We'll then move up to the Catano Prospect and drill an advanced target there that Newmont has really guided us to, where we're hoping to find more of the feeder zone, more of the trunk of the tree in that general area. So we'll be putting three deep holes there. And then based on the results that we're getting, we'll marshal our drill rigs and our drill division to wherever we need to, to get the best results for our shareholders. Um, so it's a very exciting program that we've got this year um, in terms of our, our drill program and how we're gonna be following up on that. Um, again, in the latter part of the year, we expect to be sending um, uh, one or more drill rigs down to Kyushu, where we anticipate that we'll be embarking on our first uh, barrack drill program or programs. So um, to conclude very quickly here um, with, sorry, with, um, let me get to share structure here very quickly to share structure. So currently our share structure is as follows. Newmont holds a 10% stake in our business. Some of the biggest institutions in the world, including BlackRock, RCF, um, Regal from Australia, Rothschilds from Europe, own 55% of our company. And they're there because they have toehold investments, hoping that they can follow that on to help uh, provide the financing for the building of mines in the future. Management owns 7% of the company. We have a very strong leadership team that's recently been refreshed that includes the Canadian ambassador to Japan, who has recently um, uh, stepped down from that post, um, as well as Michael Carrick, one of the top uh, mining executives uh, in the world, has put seven mines into production in five countries. Um, and also Tanika Hirsch, who is a top mining lawyer, um, also um, working with working with Baskin Martineau, but also the head of their global ESG steering committee and really keeps us on track with our ESG uh, commitments um, and a, a very experienced lawyer in Japan. In addition to that, we have uh, Mitsuhiko Yamada, of course, who's our representing, Japan, representing director in Japan and has been um, you know, a wonderful leader there as one of the top mining executives, being the past chief executive of Sumitomo Corporation's global minerals division. We have a very, very positive year going forward, um, drilling, 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 we're looking forward to the Barrick um, Alliance uh, conclusion and the selection of projects and again, getting into drilling with those projects as well. So <clears throat> the feedback I've always got is that Japan Gold has had um, uh, great success being the first mover going into Japan. We've been fortunate to put together 31 projects and bring in the two largest gold miners in the world into our business. And really our audience, um, our shareholders and the, the, the greater investment community would like to see us demonstrating that there's gold in Japan. And I think our, our drill bit um, uh, from our results, our recent results are, are really starting to demonstrate that that's the case. And we really look forward to building on that for the, the balance of the year. And so with that, I'll, I'll pause and I'll turn it back to Alina uh, for any questions. Um, thanks a lot, John. That was a great presentation. Um, I think we have time for one question. So um, the question here is, what is your barracks definition of a bankable feasibility study? Right. So <clears throat> a bankable feasibility study, um, and it's called actually uh, in the definition, it's called an acceptable bankable feasibility study. It means a project that Barrick will look at and evaluate and we'll have to have a minimum of a 15% internal rate of return. 
Now, just to expand on that a little bit, generally, when Barrett uh, goes to a destination, they're looking for either a tier one or a tier two opportunity. And a tier one opportunity is identifying a 5 million ounce deposit that they can mine 500,000 ounces a year um, for 10 years, or a, uh, a secondary tier two deposit, which is 3 million ounces where they can mine 300,000 ounces a year. Japan has a very unique model, which um, takes Barrett potentially out of that type of selection process. And that is that um, just like the Hishikari mine that's produced 8 million ounces for Sumitomo metal mining, um, the background there is that they bring their vein material to the surface, but they don't process it. They directly ship the ore to the Sumitomo smelter because the smelter is able to use the silica or the quartz waste from the, um, the gold mine as a valuable constituent in the smelting mix or process as flux. So the five major copper smelter owners in Japan who are the large companies like Sumitomo and Mitsubishi and Mitsui, they've, they've all approached us because they're running out of domestic supplies of silica or quartz. And so they would like to have that same type of arrangement with Japan Gold if we're putting a mine into production. What that means is that they would have us bring the quartz vein out of the material, out of the, the ground and ship it directly. They would buy it from us at the gate and they would directly ship it to their, their smelter. When they do that, um, they then turn around and return to us 90 to 95% of the recovered gold. So the answer to the question is that ultimately the internal rate of return for a project like that where we don't have to have the capital expenditure to build the production facility or the long period of time to put the, uh, the permitting in place uh, for a production facility, et cetera, et cetera, and the environmental permits, um, that changes the whole internal rate of return or the IRR to make a small high-grade gold mine a valuable contributor to the Barrick, um, the Barrick portfolio. So um, I, I, we'll see how the program or the programs and, and the portfolio advance, but uh, we're uh, we're very uh, optimistic that we might have something that meets their needs.